Our first speaker is Philip Curry from the University of Alberta, and he's going to be talking about uh, extracting data from poached and old quarries in the Namek Formation of Mongolia. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here again and to see so many old friends and colleagues and people who've uh, uh, shared field experiences with us. And uh, some of you have even, of course, uh, been to Mongolia and worked on some of these sites and know more or less what we're up to uh, in that part of the world. Uh, Mongolia is uh, certainly a place where resources that are very similar to the resources here in Alberta. So I have a tendency to uh, talk about uh, exotic locales when I'm in Alberta and when I'm out, out in places otherwise I talk about Alberta resources. And um, we've got uh, uh, animals, the next slide if we ever get it, uh, is Tarbosaurus or Sorolophus, I forget which one it is, but the point is that there are a lot of uh, animals in Mongolia that are very closely related to the ones we have here in Alberta. The point is that uh, uh, basically the relationships are so good that in fact uh, if we find a new type of dinosaur in Mongolia and it has never been reported before in Alberta, the chances are very good that eventually you're going to turn up the same kind of thing in this part of the world. And uh, the uh, fact is that preservational differences, um, it uh, favors different things in different localities. So if you want to supplement the information you have in your own locality, sometimes it's good to work in the opposite place because the preservation is different and you learn something more about the di types of dinosaurs you're working with. So we have many examples of uh, dinosaurs that have been found in Mongolia over the years. They're well preserved as small specimens. Velociraptor is a great uh, example. Whereas if you look at the material here in Alberta, it's uh, uh, considerably uh, less well preserved. And that's because uh, in this part of the world, of course, the um, our river systems were big, the predators like uh, tyrannosaurs were big as well and did a number on any small animals, I could eat them completely. Uh, the river systems would rip them up as well, so we tend to find small animals are preserved mostly as isolated bones and partial skeletons. So Tarbosaurus, of course, is very close to Tyrannosaurus rex, and Tarbosaurus is also close to Displetosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Albertosaurus, and so on. But uh, there are many, many examples like that. Now, we started working in uh, the Gobi back in 1996. Um, it was a program with nomadic expeditions. Many of you have been on this uh, expedition at uh, various times. And uh, this was a, a very productive set of expeditions. Uh, we made people actually work. And uh, so it wasn't just a tour of the Gobi. It was a matter of being able to go into the Gobi, uh, find uh, fossils, uh, collect those fossils which went to the institution in Ulaanbaatar. And uh, that partially overlapped with another set of expeditions we did called the uh, Korean International Dinosaur Project. Uh, there were up to seven or eight nationalities working on this uh, particular project. Uh, we finished that officially in 2010, although we still had leftover money, so we went again last year. Um, and uh, we collected lots of good material as well. Most of our focus has been in the Namegd Basin, uh, but uh, we certainly go to a lot of the more famous sites. Um, the upper picture is a very famous picture taken by the uh, Roy Chapman Andrews expeditions, the Central Asiatic expeditions of the American Museum uh, back in 1925. And of course, you can go to the same spot uh, that Shackleton, uh, took, Shackleford took the uh, photograph and uh, you can stand on a little knob and you can take the same photograph that was taken so many years ago. And uh, you can see that there are changes, but there's not a lot of changes. Uh, the interesting thing is that the erosion rates are very high there, but uh, more or less across the whole surface. So things tend to look the same after many years. Although, of course, if you look at the details, it's quite different. And uh, this is uh, another famous shot from the uh, 25 expedition. Uh, this is where they collected one of the nests of dinosaur eggs uh, back in 1925. And uh, interestingly enough, in the year 2000, we stood on the same point, looked down, and we found a nest of eggs uh, still there. So uh, it, it is not the same nest, obviously. It's eroded out uh, since, but um, you can still go and uh, 
uh, use the old information to find uh, new quarries. This is a um, uh, photograph or a, a top, uh, not a topographic, a panoramic uh, view of one of our sites and taken by Dave Eberth and uh, basically showing the, uh, how some of the formations relate to each other, two of the formations. Uh, there are three major formations in the part of the Namegd Basin where we do most of our work. And the Judocta is the uh, semi-arid, arid facies where you find Protoceratops and Velociraptor, basically the Flaming Cliffs environment. The Baron Goyet looks much the same. And then you have the Nemegd formation. And it's the Nemegd formation that produces material that's so close to what we find here in Alberta. And uh, probably what it was was a major river system cutting through the arid part of Central Asia during the late Cretaceous. And um, as a consequence of that, uh, the stacking of formations isn't quite as neat and tidy as people used to believe. It turns out that if you walk sideways, essentially, in the Nemeg Formation, that uh, the Nemeg Formation interfingers with the Baron Goyet, and you're dealing with a totally different dinosaur fauna. There is a little bit of overlap, but not very much. And uh, it's because you're looking at two different ecosystems that uh, were in the same area and different dinosaurs that are adapted for those different ecosystems. So um, although we work in the Baron Goyet as well, uh, most of our work has been in the Nemegd Formation. And uh, this is uh, uh, Nemegd Mountain in the distance. And uh, the basin, of course, is to the south of Nemegd Mountain. Uh, the Nemegd Formation uh, is in the Nemegd Basin, but it also extends outside of the basin. And uh, this is the Nemegd locality. So it uh, should be fairly easy to remember that. Uh, we collect a lot of uh, um, articulated specimens. That's one of the amazing things about this part of Mongolia, is where in Dinosaur Provincial Park we tend to find millions of bones, and every now and then we find a good skeleton. In the Nemeg Valley you tend to find bones, and when you find bones you tend to find whole skeletons. Well, not whole skeletons necessarily, but articulated skeletons. And uh, there are very few bone beds, or anything we would call a bone bed in that part of the world, and very few isolated specimens for that matter too. So um, it's a kind of a unique opportunity. And on an average day in the Nemegd Formation, we'll probably find parts of uh, two or three skeletons. Um, so it's a very productive place, and it's a good place for us to get good information on, say, paleoecology. Now, um, in addition to collecting specimens like the last one I showed you, uh, we found that we can tremendously increase our database by looking for the old quarries as well and getting good information uh, on perhaps what's collected there if it happens to be a professional quarry. And uh, this is uh, an example of a Russian quarry that we found in 2008 in Hermin Sav. It's fairly easy to identify because uh, uh, they weren't the tidiest people in the world, and uh, you find cans and with Cyrillic on them and so on, and uh, so it's fairly easy to interpret what's, what, or who was there. It's a lot more difficult, of course, to figure out uh, when they were there, and unfortunately we have very few photographs and no maps showing where the different localities are. And uh, even people who were on some of those expeditions don't seem to remember what they took out of what quarry. So we've uh, very little information, in fact, on all the Russian quarries that took uh, place in the Nemeg Basin. And I should point out that the Russians started working there in 1946. And basically, uh, since 1970, have been there every single year. So they've collected a tremendous number of specimens, and we have virtually no information on uh, where their quarries are. Uh, this is an example where we did find one of their quarries, and it's easy to see. The, uh, the red arrows there point to piles of rock, and if you look closely at the ground leading up to those piles of rock, you'll see that there's a track. And these are bulldozer tracks, and that's because the Russians, uh, ever since the 1940s, have always, or almost always, had bulldozers with them so they could uncover the sites. Um, efficiently. That's what allowed them to remove 60 tons of fossils in one single year at the dragon's tomb. 
And uh, this is a locality called Alec Teg. It's actually Jadakta formation, but uh, at this site, uh, we've seen uh, skeletons of Panacosaurus in great abundance. They're not whole because the upper parts of the bodies uh, are either eroded away or uh, have been collected previously by earlier expeditions. But we get um, the feet and hands of these animals mired in the mud. And we've seen uh, 40 individuals so far. These are baby ankylosaurs. Um, but we suspect that the number may be as many as 100. Kind of a neat sight. There's another example of a Russian quarry. Uh, this is from the 1980s, a much later one. And in this case, uh, it was an ankylosaur that uh, they collected uh, probably the skull and the tail club. Uh, they had started to form one of their monoliths. That's a box they build around the partially excavated specimen. And then they pour plaster into the box, essentially to hold it together, flip the whole box over, and then uh, crate up the other side. And they never took the rest of the skeleton out. Uh, so we saw this first uh, probably uh, around 2001 or 2002, but uh, finally in 2008 we decided we were going to do something about it. We talked to people so that uh, uh, we knew that uh, the Russians were not planning to come back and ever take it out. And it's a very large ankylosaur. We're not sure at this point if it's Tarhia or Sahania. Um, but what we, were, what we were hoping to get out of this is the, uh, the limb bones because uh, the limbs uh, are not as well known as in ankylosaurs as you'd like. There's a lot of problems with uh, identifying the number of toes, for example, um, in uh, all of these ankylosaurids, and there's a lot of misinformation in the literature. Uh, I'm happy to say that in 2008, when we finally took it out, the specimen's been prepared since, and we did get um, uh, both hands and feet on this particular specimen, so um, it was worth the while. The Polish-Mongolian expeditions from uh, 1965 to 1971 uh, really were the epitome of what expeditions should be. And uh, what you're looking at here is a map produced by the Poles uh, of the Nemegt locality. Now, there were no maps available at that time, topographic maps, so they had to make their own maps. And they did that by uh, triangulating. Essentially, the geologists went um, to different points in the Badlands or along the valley walls, set up cairns. I'll show you an example in a few seconds. And uh, with those cairns, then they triangulated and hand drew maps. Uh, it's a very laborious process. Uh, Dave Eberth knows very well about it because we had to do the same thing in China in the late 1980s. But um, the cairns, number one, are still there. And secondly, by having the cairns and the hand-drawn map, they were able to map in where their different uh, specimens were collected from. So the, uh, the blue points there are quarries in the upper part of the Nemeg Valley. You're looking at a distance of maybe three to five kilometers there. And uh, all those blue points are either Polish quarries or quarries that we've been involved in uh, or things that we know about. The uh, red numbers, those are the cairns. And um, although the maps are pretty good, uh, they're not perfect. So we can go back and in some cases we can find um, the cairns still, but uh, in a lot of cases the cairns have collapsed or gone over the hills. And uh, what we've been able to do is take GPS points on the different cairns um, and figure out from the maps which cairns we see in the fields are actually represented on the map. Then what we can do is, uh, on a computer, we can distort their map until it fits the GPS points, and then we can calculate GPS points for the Polish quarries. And uh, by doing this, we've been able to pin down a lot more of the Polish sites, uh, which has been good for getting additional information from those sites, and in some cases, additional specimens. Uh, so, for example, we found that um, uh, Tarbosaurus skeleton that had been collected many years ago. In the interim period, uh, from 1965, I think it was collected, uh, there had been enough erosion there that it exposed more of the skull. So we had confirmation that it was definitely the uh, specimen that they collected. Uh, we were very lucky too in that Zofia kielin uh came out with us one year. And um, 
Uh, Zofia was the leader of the Polish-Mongolian expeditions back in the 1960s, so it was a wonderful historic occasion. Uh, she had great stories to tell us about uh, their expeditions and uh, did show us some of the sites where the Poles worked in the 1960s. Uh, I also was very lucky a few years ago to meet uh, uh, Wojciech uh, Skarzynski. Skarzynski was the main technician on the expeditions and did most of the preparation of the uh, uh, dinosaurs from Mongolia for the Polish uh, research and um, exhibitions. And uh, there's Sofia there as well. There's a picture taken in 2009. Uh, Skarzynski was wonderful in the sense that he not only had great stories, but he also showed me um, some films that they'd taken and, uh, uh, with explanations and uh, went through all of the Polish-Mongolian photographs, so I had a good record of not only the information on the maps, but also the photographs. And uh, so I was able to take that back and find a lot more of the Polish-Mongolian sites. Uh, Skarzynski, as it turned out, had been to Mongolia uh, the last time, just before, in 2008, just a week after we had left Mongolia. We didn't know that. But uh, he was a very uh, energetic kind of guy, and that's very obvious from the old photographs and the amount of material they collected, of course. But he also was the first person to sail across Mongolia. And he went back in 2008 and repeated that expedition of sailing across the uh, plains of Mongolia. So, uh, interesting uh, person to say the least. This is an example of a quarry that uh, we uh, had trouble refinding, and we shouldn't have because it was on the maps. Uh, it's a huge quarry. This is a sauropod dinosaur. And uh, we had good photographs from it. And we tried for a couple of years, and we had no luck whatsoever. And then I finally wrote to Grudzinski, who was the geologist who did those maps. And Grudzinski sent me some of his maps, uh, which we had already, but he had clues written on them. So, for example, the cafe is a place where they used to box up all of the specimens. Um, and uh, once we knew that the cafe was near the site, we could go to that site. We'd actually found it a few years earlier. And uh, there's Michael Ryan uh, standing uh, next to uh, well-endowed uh, Tyrannosaur, and uh, this is uh, some of the graffiti that's written into the walls by the cafe, because obviously uh, they would seek the shade of the walls during the heat of the day, and uh, idle minds do idle things, right? Uh, so once we found the cafe, we were able to follow the photographs back up the hill into the Badlands, and um, here's where they dragged the specimen down, and uh, we ended up at the quarry. And so we, finally, we were finally able to identify that quarry. We, of course, uh, walked near the area, but we couldn't identify it, even though we had the photographs. Ironically, a couple of years before, uh, we were working in the same area. We took out a Tarbosaurus, and uh, because there's no way to get a truck up there, we went down exactly the same trail, dragging the Tarbosaurus, as they had dragged the sauropod out. And, of course, we didn't know that. Uh, poaching is a major problem in Mongolia, and it's over the years become bigger and bigger and bigger. This is an example where we knew there was a Tarbosaurus uh, right here. It had been found by the Poles in 1965 and mapped. Uh, we'd seen it many times over the years, uh, but one year we went back, I think it was 2003, and in 2003 some poachers had come in and dug up the top part of the skeleton. And uh, we looked at it and we were very discouraged by the whole thing because it had been there so long. It wasn't a bad specimen, but they basically hacked the whole thing up. A bigger surprise, though, was in 2004 we came back and uh, we saw this plaster jacket just lying there. And the plaster jacket was lying there because the poachers had come back in the meantime, dug deeper into the ground, into the quarry, found the skull, jacketed it with plaster, but because they didn't usually use that technique. The plaster was too thin. It was kind of like a paper bag, and uh, it collapsed. So the skull was destroyed. They went in, they hacked the teeth out of the skull, and that's all they took. And so the rest of the skull was left in the bottom of the quarry, and that's what you're looking at, uh, badly hacked up. And um, over the years, I found that uh, uh, the number of poached quarries has increased dramatically. Um, in uh, the late 90s, uh, we didn't see a, uh, much evidence of poaching. We did see some. 
by the year 2000, it had become pretty bad. Um, and I have to tell you that in most cases, uh, they don't take whole specimens. So we're able to go to the poach quarries and identify what specimens were there, what specimens they've destroyed. And uh, um, most of the time, I collect part of the specimen that's diagnostic or has some information on the size of the animal uh, so that we have a record of what's there. Um, here's a, just a quick example of a little animal called Ava Mimus. Uh, this is a skeleton collected by one of the Japanese expeditions. But uh, this is a poach quarry we found. And uh, there we found not just one individual, but many, many individuals. We figure there's at least 20 in the, in the quarry. Uh, they didn't collect most of this stuff. It was a chicken-sized animal, very poorly known. Luckily, we found parts of skulls as well. And so uh, we're doing a little bit of work these days on Ava Mimus, not only in terms of um, the anatomy of the animal, which is poorly known, but also in terms of the possible behavior of the animal, because so many individuals were found together, and some more uh, cranial bones. <clears throat> and then I uh, put this as an example of uh, uh, a change in the fortunes of some of the po poachers, because the Mongolian government in recent years has been cracking down on, on the poachers, and uh, they've been able to seize a number of specimens before they've left the country. Here's a great example where there are two skulls and associated skeletons, I might add, of oviraptorosaurs. And this is uh, very different than the ones that we know. Uh, the big problem with this specimen, of course, is we don't know where it came from in Mongolia. Um, so even though specimens are getting seized, it's a problem. Last year, um, uh, Tarbosaurus got auctioned in New York for $1.2 million. Uh, luckily, the Mongolian government asked the American government to step in on this because it was illegally exported out of Mongolia. Uh, all kinds of things uh, uh, in terms of rules broken and so on. This isn't the skull that, uh, as part of that specimen. I actually don't have a good picture of the skeleton. But uh, uh, as a result of that, there have been a lot of other seizures in the United States now. Uh, including this skull, which is one we looked at fairly recently. Well, I just wanted to finish by saying that uh, to give you an idea of how many specimens there are, we've now identified and seen 98 quarries of Tarbosaurus in the Nemeg Formation. Um, we've seen many footprint sites. We've seen 52 hadrosaur sites. Now, that ratio is very interesting because almost half of the specimens we find are carnivores, and uh, there's something wrong with that. And that's why I'm interested in the site uh, for research purposes. And, uh, um, you know, we'll continue this work uh, um, in terms of identifying specimens, but uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. And uh, we have a big team of international scientists, including people here at the Terrell Museum, who are working with us on this. And we hope in the next few years to produce a scientific book of papers on just the Nemeg Formation, very similar to the one we did for Dinosaur Provincial Park. And uh, here's an unabashed advertisement. <laughs> uh, that's not for the scientific book, but we're also doing a children's book right now. And uh, we're trying to raise funds so that we can complete this. It's done through the University of Alberta. Uh, the purpose of this book really isn't to do Dinosaurs of Mongolia for North American audiences, even though the first shot at it will be an English edition. The purpose of doing this is to put free copies of a Mongolian translation of this book into every school in Mongolia as a way to try and start educating Mongolians about the importance of their own resources and hopefully have some impact on the poaching ultimately. Thank you very much.